So I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, one of them is semi-stochastic quantum Monte Carlo, which is a hybrid method which tries to capture the main advantages of exact diagonalization and QMC methods in the same uh, method. Uh, so I, will, uh, I think I would spend about 45 minutes on that. In the last 15 minutes, I will change gears completely and talk about something completely different, where we are looking at the uh, uh, zigzag uh, phase transition in quantum wires studied with diffusion Monte Carlo. OK. Uh, so uh, this is an outline of the talk. Uh, the, uh, I gave an earlier version of this talk to an audience which was sort of 80% DFT and 20% quantum Monte Carlo. And so I gave a fair amount of introduction to quantum Monte Carlo in that talk. And I was going to remove that completely from this talk. But then I sort of realized that we come from different quantum Monte Carlo communities. And it may be useful to keep uh, some of that there, uh, uh, if nothing else, to establish a common uh, 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 notation and terminology. So I will begin with some uh, introduction where I uh, cast variational projector Monte Carlo in the same framework. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the sign problem. And then I'll get into the new stuff, which is the semi-stochastic one of Monte Carlo, which was done with Peter Nightingale and uh, th uh, th uh, three students. And uh, at the end, I will talk about the zigzag phase transitions. And the main person there is Harold Barage at Duke and his student, Abhijit Mehta. Uh, I should say that the work on the semi-stochastic quantum Monte Carlo was uh, 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 entirely motivated by the FCI QMC work of the uh, uh, Ali Alavi group. And I've benefited uh, greatly by talking to uh, both Ali and George Booth. Uh, there's a related work uh, that was done by two Japanese people, though they, have, they didn't push things as far. And I've also benefited greatly from discussions with all of these people, particularly Brian Clark. OK. So let me uh, just uh, establish some notation first. Uh, we have an exact wave function, and we will expand that uh, in a basis. And we call those expansion coefficients e. You, uh, uh, it's useful to have a trial wave function, and, those, uh, and its coefficients will be denoted by t. And a guiding wave function uh, and uh, its coefficients will be denoted by g. OK, so what's the difference between the trial and the guiding wave function? The trial wave function will be used for calculating variational and mixed estimators, whereas the guiding wave function will be used to alter the probability density that is sampled. OK, so the probability density that's sampled in VMC is typically uh, psi g squared. Uh, and uh, in diffusion Monte Carlo, it is psi, or projector Monte Carlo, it's psi g times the ground state. Okay? And so uh, psi g, uh, the answers depend only on psi t. The expectation values depend only on psi t. But the statistical errors will depend uh, uh, both on psi t uh, uh, and, uh, and psi g. Now, since psi g is used to uh, uh, change the distribution that's being sampled, uh, a requirement on psi g is that it must be non-zero for all states where the exact uh, state uh, uh, has non-zero components. Psi t does not satisfy this condition. Okay? Uh, uh, but if psi t does, then one is free to choose psi g and psi t to, uh, to, uh, to be equal. Okay? And, uh, and that's uh, frequently what's done. And, uh, and, uh, what I will do in, in part of this talk, uh, I will either set psi t psi g equal to psi t or psi g equal to 1, which corresponds to no important sampling. OK, so in variational Monte Carlo, you're just calculating the expectation value with respect to a trial wave function. You introduce complete sets of states. You, uh, you, uh, you use your definition of what psi t is. You, rewrite, uh, you rearrange terms so that you have a probability density function, which is positive, definite, and integrates to 1. So you sample that, and, so, and then uh, uh, you calculate your energy with, by just averaging the local energy. If psi g is not equal to psi t, this expression changes uh, so that you have uh, the ratio of psi t over uh, psi g squared uh, uh, in your expectation values. Okay. 
Uh, one thing that people are, are often seem to assume is that using uh, uh, important sampling always uh, uh, reduces your statistical error. But for a fixed psi t, there's nothing that says that psi g equal to psi t uh, minimizes uh, the statistical fluctuations. Uh, uh, of course, if uh, in the limit that you that psi t becomes exact, uh, uh, you know the statistical error disappears. But for a fixed psi t, uh, it's not at all clear what's the optimal uh, psi g. Right, so using psi g equal to psi t, all that uh, achieves is that it makes the fluctuations in the denominator uh, vanish. But what you want to minimize is the fluctuations of the entire quantity, not the fluctuations in the denominator. OK, so projector Monte Carlo is very much the same thing, except that you take advantage of the fact that the pure estimator that you're interested in the true, is equal to the mixed estimator. And so then again, uh, you, you start with the mixed estimator. Again, you introduce complete uh, sets of states. Uh, you arrange, rearrange. And again, you get an average of the local energy over the Monte Carlo configurations. The only difference is that now it's, uh, the configurations are not sampled from uh, the square of the guiding wave function, but they're uh, sampled from the exact wave function times the square of, sorry, times the guiding wave function. Okay, and of course you get the exact wave function by using a, a projector, which we'll come to in a moment. Okay, and again, if psi g is not equal to psi t, then you get these uh, uh, weight factors entering in here. Okay. Okay, so uh, both of these methods uh, involve uh, calculating an average of the local energy over two, two different distributions. And they are practical, provided that your wave function, you can write down a good wave function that can be evaluated in polynomial time. So yesterday, we had a lot of discussion uh, with Kevin about the fact that in nuclear physics, it's not possible to do that. Fortunately, in electronic structure theory, it is possible to do that. Uh, and so uh, uh, these are useful methods for electronic structure theory. And the other thing that you require is that the local energy can be calculated quickly which means that either uh, you're in a continuous space and then uh, your local energy, uh, you, uh, your kinetic energy is off-diagonal, but it's only off-diagonal in a very, very limited way. You just have to calculate the uh, uh, Laplacian, so that, uh, that can be done. Uh, or if you're in a discrete space, then uh, 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 your uh, H has to be sparse, otherwise you cannot afford to do the sum <coughs> over a, uh, some enormous set of states. OK. So the various projector Monte Carlo methods, the, the main things that distinguish them from each other are the form of the projector that's used. So the projector can, is any function of the Hamiltonian that makes the desired uh, state the dominant state of the projector. And so here are some of the choices of the projectors that are used in the literature and the space in which the walk is done. And the space is specified by both the single particle basis, which can be either uh, discrete or continuous, and by whether one is working in first or second quantization. Okay, and so I've written down some of the uh, methods that uh, uh, are familiar to people. Uh, the GFMC here, I'm using it in the more restricted uh, sense of the word, the domain GFMC, which is really how the word should be used uh, rather than how it is used. Uh, 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 and uh, you know, only a few, few people, as far as I can tell, have done anything interesting with it. Uh, and uh, those three people are all listed here. Uh, OK. So now, uh, moving on to the sign problem. So if you're, uh, let's say first think about the sign problem in diffusion Monte Carlo, right? So the projector is the exponential form of the projector. Uh, and in real space, it has this approximate form, right? And it's, so it's non-negative, so that's good. But the problem is, of course, that it projects you onto the, uh, onto the bosonic ground state. Uh, and so you have to do something more to try to get the fermionic ground state. So in practice, uh, uh, all except a few calculations have been done with the fixed node approximation, which gives another bound to the energy. Okay. So if you want to try to get the fermionic state, 
uh, in uh, diffusion Monte Carlo. What you have to do is the following. So schematically, I'm showing you so the uh, bosonic ground state here. The red shows the uh, fermionic ground state, and blue is some trial wave function. So what you need to do then is to start off with positive walkers sampled from the positive lobe of the trial wave function, negative walkers sampled from the negative lobe. And you, then you evolve each of these. And each of these distributions tries to go, of course, to the bosonic ground state. And the difference gives you uh, what you want. Okay. Now, this is all fine uh, if you are doing a deterministic projection. But in practice, of course, you're doing Monte Carlo, so things become a mess because you have to uh, uh, take the difference of these two things. Uh, uh, and that's a much harder th th thing to do. In fact, in, uh, I will argue that if you're, doing, uh, if you're working in first quantization, it is even in principle impossible to, to do this. So I, I will come to that in a, in a moment. OK, so uh, in second quantization, you're, you're working with an anti-symmetric basis. So there's no possibility of get, having a bosonic ground state. So at first sight, one may think that there is no sign problem because there's no possibility of getting a bosonic state. Okay, But we all know very well that there is a sign problem, even, even in second quantization. And that, of course, comes from the fact that uh, paths leading from state i to state j can contribute with opposite sign. Uh, okay, So uh, in special cases, there will be no sign problem. When the projector, uh, so the projector does not have a sign problem if all the columns of the projector have the same sign structure aside from an overall sign. Okay, So in that case, you can easily convince yourself that all moves to a given state will always contribute with positive or negative sign. And if that's true, in fact, you can just trivially change the sign of the uh, 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 negative states and just make the projector everywhere positive. Okay. So uh, when you do, do second quantization, the sign problem is an issue only because of the stochastic nature of the algorithm. Uh, uh, if, if walkers with different signs land on a given state at a given Monte Carlo move, you can just trivially cancel them. The problem is that when they uh, land with different signs at the, on different Monte Carlo generations, then you don't have any way to cancel them. Because you are not storing past information. That's the whole point of Monte Carlo, that uh, you know, at each step uh, you're dealing with a relatively small sample. OK. So now uh, that was all an introduction to uh, the FCI QMC method of uh, uh, of uh, Alavi and, uh, and co-workers, right? So uh, my view of their method is that what they really showed is that if you uh, work in second quantization, then it is possible to find a large enough population uh, such that cancellations work and give you a, a stable signal to noise, OK? Uh, so uh, in practice, what you find is that there's a fairly sharp transition from uh, a situation where you have no signal to noise to uh, a situation, uh, once you pass a cr certain critical population, you find that uh, the uh, a si a signal to noise stabilizes and you get a finite signal to noise ratio. Okay, So that was done in their first paper. Uh, it still requires an unreasonably large population, even for small systems. So in the second uh, paper, they introduced an initiator approximation. So what this uh, does is that you only allow walkers that are, are on states that are, have a significant occupation from uh, spawning onto other states. Okay. So as soon as you do that, of course, you're introducing an you introduce an approximation. But the approximation is such that by simply turning uh, a knob, by increasing the size of the population, uh, the, uh, the approximation goes away. Because if you have a large enough population, every state has a, uh, has, a, uh, 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 has more than that certain number of walkers. And so there is, uh, there is no approximation being made anymore. OK? So of, of, uh, of course, in practice, uh, you will never reach the situation where every state has that. Because if, if you could do that, then you wouldn't do uh, quantum Monte Carlo. You would just do exact diagonalization. Right? Uh, 
Uh, uh, but in, 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 in practice, because th th uh, the distribution is peaked, and you don't need to occupy a, a, every state to get a sufficiently high accuracy, uh, 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 this helps. OK? So uh, after these two papers, they have, sub they have published uh, many uh, subsequent papers on a variety of systems, molecules, the homogeneous electron gas, and also on real solids. The largest system that they have treated has as many as 10 to the 108 states, okay, which is an astronomical number. However, uh, it should be noted that the number of states is really not uh, 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 what controls the, dif the difficulty of the problem. What really controls is the number of states that have significant o occupation. And that's, of course, much, much smaller than this for the problem that they treated. OK. No questions so far? So audience be, well, is me. If I understand correctly, the scaling, what? It, the scaling of the method is still. It is still exponential, but, but, but with a much smaller, smaller but with a much smaller exponent uh, than if you were doing a regular full CI. Yeah. That is an okay. unusual Monte Carlo, because Monte Carlo usually is supposed to scaling, which is not fully known yet. Yeah, but remember, you're not doing a fixed node or some other approximation, no, right? And so, so then. I mean, the cancellation yeah. methods that Mal yeah. has used in real yeah. space, yeah. then those have an infinite number of states. And, right. And they're also exponential, but do right. work for few body problems. Correct. Yep. That's, that, that, that's correct. Yeah. Simple question. Yeah. So if CI is Sorry, full configuration interaction. And uh, so that's chemical terminology. These are chemists. Uh, so, you know, exact diagonalization for physicists, right? Uh, and so, uh, actually, this method has grew, uh, received much more attention from the chemists than from the physicists because it's written, it's in the language of chem that chemists understand, right? Chemists, for chemists, the holy grail is, gra gra grail is doing full CI, and this allows you to do full CI in a stochastic way, okay? Okay. So uh, uh, th uh, there were a couple of papers uh, uh, that analyzed the, uh, the sign problem in, in, in FCI uh, Q uh, QMC. So the first of these uh, pointed out that the instability gap is given in the, by the difference in the dominant eigenvalues of the projector and those of the projector with all the off-diagonal elements uh, made. Uh, are re replaced by their absolute values. Okay. In the second paper, they address the issue of when is the instability gap different in first quantization and second quantization. And what they argued is th that, uh, so when you work in second quantization, there are, of course, several Hartree states that make up uh, a given uh, a determinal state, right? So if there is more than one Hartree state that maps onto more than one Hartree state that belongs to a, a given second quantized state that maps onto a given Hartree state, uh, 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 then uh, if there if these contribute with different signs, then there is internal cancellation going on by using second quantization, and so that reduces the gap. If there's no internal cancellation going on then the gap is the same in first quantization and second quantization. When you say first quantization, yeah. then you mean a basis that doesn't have any symmetry. Right. Okay. Right. That's what I, I mean. It can also mean in first quantization an asymmetric basis. So, sorry. So I'm using the words to mean uh, do you symmetrize the basis or you don't symmetrize the basis? So the okay. that Peter Monte Carlo would be in first Yeah. Right. Uh, I just don't like the word because first quantization doesn't mean that normally. Okay. Uh, maybe I should have called it unsymmetrized yeah. basis and symmetrized but, basis. But I'm, I'm completely happy with that. That's okay. What you're saying. But once okay. I know what you <coughs> mean, I'm also happy. So. Okay. Okay. So that's what I mean, and uh, I will try to say what makes you happy. But if I forget, no, you know no, what I mean. I, I, <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm okay. It's not the uh, okay. So. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the second paper, uh, uh, they also gave you examples. So if you're dealing with the, the, uh, 
with uh, Coulomb systems on a lattice in real space, or uh, real or momentous space Hubbard models, then the gap is the same uh, uh, using a symmetrized or a non-symmetrized basis. But if you're using, uh, if you're uh, doing orbital space Coulomb systems, then it is then it is different. Okay. Uh, what these papers did not point out is uh, two things. The first thing is f fairly obvious, and certainly the authors were well aware of that, uh, which is that the Hilbert space is n factorial times smaller in second quantization, and so can cancellation uh, uh, is more effective when you use a symmetric basis than when you don't use a symmetric basis. So it's smaller, so it's no, no, it's smaller. It's a, you know, the, uh, you're, you're combining n factorial uh, uh, functions into one function, so it's smaller. But, it, but right. it's also better connected in the sense of you. you well, the be better connected doesn't uh, do, uh, does doesn't help. I mean, what helps is that the, uh, the, there's fewer states, and so there's more cancellation going on. Okay. I have uh, a question though, yeah. on this. I mean, when yeah. Hal did his cancellations, yeah. some of the time. He used the, the term determinatal Green's function of Gaussians yeah. for the cancellation. So you would have said he was doing diffusion in second quantization. That's right. Even though you would if also it, say diffusion Monte Carlo's in first. If he did that, uh, I would I, I I would say he's using well he's using a symmetrized basis uh, so yeah, second quantization. Exactly. Yeah, and you have to do, and my uh, okay so I, let me, I'll come to that in a second. The, the second point is that if you are working uh, in a non-symmetric basis, then remember you have to use these two bosonic populations. And just because of fluctuations, one of the two will eventually dominate. And eventually, you'll be left with just walkers of the same sign, okay? and there'll be nothing to cancel against. And so you will have zero signal to noise eventually. okay? So it is essential uh, to use uh, a symmetric basis. The, the only way that having a large population plus cancellation can work is if you use a symmetrized basis. If you don't use a symmetrized basis and do, don't do anything else to mimic a symmetrized basis in some sneaky way, you are bound to fail. Okay? So large populations plus cancellations only work, only can only work, in second quantization. Okay, so th th that's an important point. Okay, so uh, this is a comparison of sort of the virtues, uh, the, the many differences between uh, diffusion Monte Carlo and FCI QMC. Uh, uh, but this, these are sort of the main uh, virtues and drawbacks of each method. Okay, so DMC on the left, FCI QMC on the right. And in red, I'm showing uh, red denotes a disadvantage and green denotes an advantage, right? So uh, diffusion Monte Carlo has a severe uh, sign problem, whereas FCI QMC has a less severe sign problem. And because this has a severe problem, you are pretty much forced to do uh, a, a, a fixed node, whereas here, cancellations uh, uh, can, can do the job for you for small systems, OK? Uh, each of these methods becomes exact in some limit. Uh, diffusion Monte Carlo becomes ex exact in the limit that the nodes of the site uh, are exact. This becomes uh, exact in the limit of infinite population. But this, you know, um, uh, optimizing a site trial requires some work. Uh, it requires having a good optimization method, whereas here all you need is a more powerful computer. Okay. I'm coming to that. Uh, I'm coming to that. That's the next point, right? The advantage of diffusion Monte Carlo is that here uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, you, you automatically have an infinite basis, whereas here uh, you have to, you're working in, the, uh, uh, in a finite basis, just as the quantum chemists do, and you have to extrapolate to an uh, infinite basis. That's, that's what you wanted me to say, right? Uh, I just meant I mean, it's not what? really exact to a finite basis. It's Pardon? Okay. Uh, diffusion Monte Carlo with the fixed node is a lot cheaper than this. Okay, so this is polynomial. This is exponential with a reduced exponential. Is there an estimate of this exponent in OCI method? Pardon me? Is there an estimate how 
Oh, uh, so uh, th there's a paper by the Alavi group that says that it's uh, uh, the exponent is 0.16 times the exponent, but I think that's you know that's system dependent. Uh, Very system dependent. Uh, yeah. No, no, but with the initiator, it, it, it is smaller. Uh, without, the, without the initiator, uh, Brian is, of course, right. <coughs> okay. okay. But, but the small number is in front of the exponential, or is it in the exponent? No, no. The small in the ex it's a smaller exponent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but as Brian said, uh, you know, it's, it's much smaller when you use the initiator approximation. Which often is a good approximation, but not always. Okay, I mean, you, you, uh, it's a tr you, then you have to do this tricky extrapolation to uh, infinite uh, Walker number, which is not as trivial as it may uh, seem at first sight, right? So you know, it's easy enough to say that all you need is an infinite is a large enough population, okay? But to, to know what is large enough is not always easy. The good news is that for chemical systems, it behaves nicely, smoothly, and monotonically, and uh, converges from above. But that's not always the case. So okay. How, how large systems they were able to do? Pardon? How big systems were they able to do? Few uh, well, I mean, they have uh, the larger systems they have done uh, ha have on the uh, on the order of 54 uh, particles, but but it's not just the number of particles. It, it depends very much on the size of the basis. Right, so the cost goes up rapidly with the size of the basis, whereas in diffusion Monte Carlo, you're always right from the beginning working with an infinite basis. It also depends very heavily on sort of the sign problem in that given model. Yeah. And so some models would be able to do a much bigger system. Right. So I mean, if you're, if you're doing a small U Hubbard model, you can do a very large system. But as soon as you go to large U, uh, you know, uh, things become much more difficult. So can, can, yeah. Is the efficiency No. So in fact, that's one of the games one could play that nobody has played successfully to try to improve the situation. Absolutely. OK. OK, so uh, another advantage of the FCI QMC is that you can do a frozen core calculation. You don't have to mess around with pseudo potentials, which are always a little bit worrisome. Right. OK. <coughs> so no, now. Uh, all of that was introduction to uh, our work, OK? So our idea is to basically uh, have a method that combines the advantages of exact diagonalization QMC. So exact diagonalization, as we know, has no statistical error or sign problem, but it's limited to a small number of states, OK? Small meaning is on the order of 10 to the 10, OK? QMC has statistical errors and sign problem, but can use a much larger number, OK? So uh, both of these, OK, you can do exact diagonalization by using a projector, right? Uh, a deterministic projector uh, is exact diagonalization. A stochastic projector is projector QMC, right? So why not combine the two, right? Th that, that's the whole idea, and thereby get the advantages of, uh, of both methods. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So how do you estimate the error of the stage you throw out? Oh, no. I mean, the, 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 you only estimate that error by uh, increasing the size of the space, right? But so exact. The, 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 the word exact, it's improper because you don't know how it is. It, it is improper, but that is standard physics usage, OK? Well, uh, or if you prefer easy. the chemistry terminology, it's, it's f easy. full CI. Yeah, uh, but in, in local physics, you know what we do? We renormalize the interaction. Correct. Right, with yeah, the so space. By normalizing the interaction, you can actually get a much better result. It's not only local physics. Yeah, he does the same thing. In general, 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 general,
I tried to uh, I tried to do that with my usage of GFMC. <laughs> but I, I'm not I'm not going to f try to fight every battle one can fight. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So um, here's your large space. You know, ten to the twenty, ten to the hundred, whatever. And uh, you identify a small space. Oh, so I should have said bef before in the previous one that although I'm, I'm talking about uh, semi-stochastic quantum Monte Carlo, in some sense it's, it's, it's more general. right? It's, it's a method for finding the dominant eigenvalue and corresponding expectation values for any large sparse matrix that has much of its spectral weight uh, you know, concentrated on a manageable number of states. right? Uh, OK. So, uh, so here is the small space which has a la uh, large amount of the spectral weight. So we are going to do the projection. What, what do you mean by spectral weight? Well, um, uh, you, you have your expansion of the true wave function. Okay. If, uh, if I sum ci squared, OK, so, so the sum of ci squared over the entire space is 1 if I have a normalized wave function. right? And if this, uh, this sum uh, uh, already adds up to, let's say, 0.7, then I'm saying that the small space already have how has. Do you know, how do you know this is small space? Because sometimes you can. How do you know the long range coupling with like many matrix elements are coupled efficiently? And then how would you determine this? Is this? Uh, I, I, I will. I will. This is typically done in uh, orbital space. Uh, but I, 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 will, I will get to the question of how we choose, choose the space in a, in a moment. Let, let, let me go, go on for a moment, OK? Uh, so if you can identify a small space, uh, uh, then in, in, when the moves are, when the initial and the final state are within that small space, you do that stochastically, I mean, deterministically. And if either the initial or the final is outside that space, then you do it uh, determinist. Uh, sorry, stochastic. If it's in the green area, you do, do it deterministically. If it's in the blue area, you do it stochastically. Okay. And so I've bro broken up my projector into these two two pieces. Okay. So uh, in a little bit, little bit more detail, we distinguish between the diagonal moves and the off-diagonal moves. Okay. So for the diagonal moves, we just uh, do this. So remember, your projector is 1 plus tau e trial minus h. So the, here's your projector. Okay. Uh, for the off-diagonal moves, if a given state has a weight wi, so as usual in Monte Carlo, you try to uh, have walkers which all have approximately the small weight, it's the same weight, right? And so you, uh, you consider uh, uh, that state as having ni walkers where ni is the uh, nearest integer to wi, uh, okay, uh, max of that comma 1. Uh, and then for each of these walkers, you propose a move with some probability. And then you, uh, you, uh, you, you, take, you give a weight to that move, which of course must be proportional to the uh, projector matrix element. And it must be proportional to the weight of that water, walker, which is wi divided by ni. And then, of course, you have to divide by the probability that you propose the move. right? <coughs> OK, so, so uh, that's what you do for the stochastic moves. Okay? And if, it's, if they are both in the, um, in the deterministic space, then for the stochastic part, you give it a weight 0, because you're going to take care of that deterministically. OK? And then finally, for the deterministic space, of course, you just do a, a usual sparse matrix vector multiply. Okay, that's your deterministic projection. So it's very, very simple. Okay, so the total uh, uh, algorithm consists of the following. So you, you have your walkers, which are labeled by uh, 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 by the occupation num numbers. Okay, so you just use one bit. Uh, per orbital to specify whether that orbital is occupied or not. Okay, So you do the deterministic and the stochastic projection, as I described in the last two view graphs. Then you sort by the walker labels. Why do we sort? Because we want to be able to combine walkers that are on the same one to do the cancellation. Okay, So once we've uh, uh, sorted them, we can, we can merge them. Okay. 
if you're using an initiator, you can, uh, uh, you can at that point uh, 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 impose the initiator c uh, condition. Now, since we are using real weight walkers and we, want, uh, we don't want to waste a lot of time, uh, the, this is just as usual in any quantum Monte Carlo method, you want all your walkers to have uh, approximately the same weight. And so we uh, join uh, small weight walkers in an unbiased way. Okay? Uh, you, you can either join walkers or you can integerize walkers. Joining has the advantage that if you are using a growth estimator, it doesn't introduce uh, uh, unnecessary fluctuations. Okay? And then uh, uh, you calculate the contrib uh, contribution through the energy expectation value uh, using uh, local energy components that have already been uh, pre-calculated uh, and stored. Okay? And so it's, it's a very uh, simple algorithm. Uh, and so before you start the Monte Carlo part, you choose the deterministic space, and you pre-compute all the matrix elements uh, within that deterministic space, right? Because that's going to be done. You know it's going to, you're going to do it at every Monte Carlo step, right? So you don't want to recalculate it. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment, OK? You also choose the trial wave function, and you pre-compute the local energy components for that trial wave function, OK? Because again, uh, uh, that's going to uh, get used a lot, and you don't want to recalculate it every time. OK, so now how, how do we find the deterministic space and the, uh, and, the, and, the, the, uh, and the trial wave function? So we use the same procedure for both, though not necessarily the same uh, uh, parameters for both, OK? So we uh, typic typically, uh, you have some state, let's say the Hartree-Fock state, which, uh, which has a fairly significant weight in your wave function. Okay? So you start with that state, and you construct uh, uh, single and double excitations, because your Hamiltonian is, uh, that we are using has only single and double uh, uh, terms in it. Okay? If, you can, if your total space is small enough that you but can. I will, I'm getting to that. Uh, if your space is uh, small enough that you can afford all single and double excitations, you would do all. Otherwise, you would you know, use the lower lying orbitals and use, do single and double excitations there. OK, now from, uh, from these states, you choose the most important of these, and then you excite from those again. OK, so now you're getting triple and quadruple excitations. OK. Again, you choose the most important ones from those and excite again. Now you're getting five and six-fold excitations, OK? And then you s stop at some, s some stage, OK? Typically, it's uh, not worth going beyond six-fold excitations, OK? So by doing this, you iteratively uh, build up uh, uh, a deterministic space or a trial wave function that uh, t uh, tends to have the most important uh, 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 states uh, in it. So typically, you know, you may u use on the order of a thousand or a million of these because remember, you don't, you not only store uh, the states themselves, but also their uh, connections. Okay. Uh, I should say that uh, so far, uh, all the results uh, that I will sh show you were obtained on a single core. We have not yet parallelized our program, although it can be parallelized very easily. Yeah. In order to take advantage of the deterministic part, how much? Yeah. Is well, as much as you can afford to store, right? So uh, eventually, uh, if you make the space too large, uh, you, uh, you will exceed your memory, right? You want to get 50% or something? You want to get as much as you can, <laughs> right? Uh, the more you get, the better it will be, OK? But, uh, but I think you, your point is that if, uh, if your spectral weight is so distributed that you can never afford to get more than a, you know, a small fraction, then it's not going to be very useful. You're completely right. But in that case, actually, even the original method would be a total disaster. I mean, where the FCIQMC method works, SQMC is orders of magnitude faster. Okay? But, but uh, neither of them will work for a completely general uh, situation. Okay? So I mean, a simple situation is if you just try to do the Hubbard model in momentum space with a very large U, it will not work. Right? I mean, if it's a very large, you, uh, maybe by doing real space, you can get it to work. But if you use the wrong basis, it will not work. Because if, if 
years ago, I actually did something similar to this. Uh -huh. I showed the paper later afterwards. But oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we had the same problem that when you go up to 8 by 8 with large U, yeah. but then going beyond that, it, you couldn't capture enough of the norms of the, the yeah. ground state. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah. OK. So s some differences between uh, uh, what we are doing and, and the Alavi group. So of course, the main difference is this idea of using a deterministic uh, 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 projection for part of the space. But there are uh, other differences that are uh, relevant, too. So we use real weights for uh, uh, most of the calculation. And that reduces uh, you know, the fluctuations qu uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit. And it allows you to you know, uh, build up weight on, uh, on a given determinant by having several small contributions. Uh, 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 another very important difference is that for doing the mixed estimator, they use just the Hartree-Fox state, whereas we use this multi-determinant state. And that reduces. Uh, uh, the fluctuations uh, in the local energy a lot. A uh, small difference is that they use a fixed initiator, whereas we use an initiator threshold that increases depending on uh, how many steps you've made since you last visited the deterministic space. Right? So the, I mean, the idea is that uh, the further away you are from the deterministic space, the more likely you are to have a, 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 a random sign rather than the correct sign. OK, so uh, these are the main differences between the two, two methods. OK. What is the time? Oh, it's quarter two already. Uh, OK, so uh, <coughs> now to sh sh show you uh, how, how much you gain. So this is the Hubbard model, uh, uh, u equal to 4, 8 by 8, uh, with uh, t 10 electrons. OK. What I'm showing you on the x-axis is I'm increasing the size of the deterministic space. Okay? On the y-axis, I'm showing you the efficiency gain. Okay? So, uh, I'm so the, uh, the efficiency uh, uh, is 1 over the error squared uh, times time, right? Because the error, of course, goes down as the square root of the time. Okay? And so I have. Uh, Define the, uh, I have normalized the efficiency such that if I use a deterministic space of 1 okay, uh, and a trial wave function, which is also has just one determinant, then that efficiency is 1. Okay? And so the different curves are for different sizes of the trial wave function. right? So if I s keep the trial wave function to be just the Hartree-Fox state, and I increase the number of determinants, then that's the red curve, which I've blown up here, you get a factor of 20 gain in efficiency. Okay? If you increase not only the deterministic space, but also the trial wave function space, then you get a gain in the efficiency, which is on the order of three orders of magnitude. Okay? Okay. What about the bias? Very often, using the semi-stochastic approach greatly reduces the bias also. So here, I'm showing you the energy evaluated without using the semi-stochastic approach. And so there is a considerable de dependence on the size of the population, whereas when you use the semi-stochastic, it's very flat. Unfortunately, that gain is not there for all systems. So here's a, another Hubbard model where uh, uh, at small Walker numbers, you do gain, uh, uh, you reduce the bias, but at larger ones, it's pretty much the same. Okay? One thing to note, by the way, is that here we are converging from below, we, because we are calculating a mixed estimator, and uh, so, so uh, the uh, energy is not necessarily variational. Okay? It can converge either from above or below. It can also oscillate, which makes the extrapolation in difficult situations rather hard. OK, uh, this is now for a, a, a molecule. Now, uh, this is a molecule uh, where you expect higher order excitations to be important. Okay? So here I have four different trial wave functions. The green one is just the one determinant. The red one includes all double excitations. And so it has a large number of determinants, uh, over 4,000. Okay? 
but that's not the best trial wave function to use. You can use a much smaller trial wave function with only 165 determinants that includes fourfold excitations, which gives you a large, much higher gain in efficiency. Okay? And then uh, if you uh, use yet more with, uh, with up to four, fourfold excitations, then you get a gain of more than three orders of magnitude. Okay? So it's important to choose your, uh, uh, your trial wave function and determinant space in an <coughs> appropriate way. So this blue one is, a, is it like a cap XPS, something like this? This one? Yeah, the, the one below. Wh which one? No, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it just uh, has quadruple excitations, but, uh, but uh, keeping the most important ones. OK? Yeah? Can you say something about, so when you plot the efficiency, in a sense, from my point of view, it's hard to judge because it depends on, on your code in particular, how well you balance the deterministic and the stochastic in terms of, just purely from the point of view of computer science. Uh, can you say something about just the error part, which would be something that we can do? Of just the what? The, the error part of the. The what part? The, the error error part. Error part on the deterministic side. Uh, if, if he's not interested in the time, he's just interested in how your errors. Oh, oh, you, uh, oh, okay. Well, so I mean, if I just plotted versus error, then the gain would be even larger because the computer time goes up a little bit. Okay, but, but most of the d difference comes from the error. I mean, the change in the computer time is quite minor. Okay? Uh, okay, but I was putting in the time to, to give a fair comparison. I mean, right? it's, it's, it's not, from my point of view, it's not fair in that it depends on how you code a thing. I mean, if, if you write a, a different code, uh, especially when you put that in At, at zeroth level, these, these will look very much the same. Okay? okay? Uh, and in fact, it will look even better if I didn't put the time there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, here's some uh, uh, statements about the future. So uh, uh, how to improve the method. So first of all, uh, uh, you know, the method depends on the choice of the basis, uh, and so. Uh, uh, there are many ways of uh, of possibly trying to improve the basis, doing you know uh, using rotated orbitals, for example. Another thing that we have done recently that I didn't talk about is that instead of using the we remove the Hartree Fox state and replace it by uh, the trial wave function as one of the uh, states that, uh, for doing the walk. When you do that, of course, you end up with a non-orthogonal basis, and a general non-orthogonal basis would be a would be too complicated for this method. But this particular non-orthogonality you can take care of at no additional cost. <coughs> okay? And so you can get an uh, additional gain by replacing the Hartree Fox state by, by, by uh, a trial wave function. Now, uh, when we do that, there is some uh, peculiarity in how the method behaves, which I don't have time to discuss. But in the, in the, in the interesting situations, you do get an additional gain by, by doing this. Uh, <coughs> you can improve, of course, the, the trial wave functions and the deterministic space. Uh, 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 one of the disadvantages we, that we talked about was the fact that you are, only have a finite basis error. And somebody asked about uh, ways to improve that. And so there is work being done to use F12 methods to improve the uh, basis set convergence. So basically, there you uh, add in functions that uh, have the correct cusp condition and thereby get a faster rate of uh, con convergence. Uh, there's also work being done that I'm not involved in. Uh, so uh, Garnet Chen's group uh, uh, and George Booth working with Garnet Chen have done quite a bit of work on embedding. Uh, uh, so that's another way of getting around the finite size errors. And there is work going on on excited states uh, uh, using uh, two or three different uh, methods for doing that. OK, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. And I have seven minutes to go through the second part of the talk. OK, so changing gears completely, uh, quantum wires, here's the, here's the Hamiltonian. OK, so extended in one dimension, a parabolic potential in, in the other dimension. Okay. 
Electrons interact with the usual Coulomb uh, interaction. OK, so uh, the point is, what happens when you start from a low density of electrons? Uh, this so is two or three dimensions. It's, the, it's totally two dimensions. But, you, but it would essentially be the same in the third dimension. You know, if, I had, if I added a third dimension uh, with uh, zi uh, squared, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, not much would change. <coughs> Uh, so, of course, at low density, you, you, you uh, get a Wigner crystal. At high density, you get a liquid. But in between, you get a zigzag phase transition. So th that's what I want, wanted to talk how, about. How the yeah. width, harmonic, harmonic length, or oscillate length compares with the four ratios? Uh, I'll, 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 come to, I'll, come to, I'll come to that in a moment. So there are two, two length, length scales in the problem. One of them is the RS. And the other is R0, uh, which is uh, uh, the distance at which the confinement and the Coulomb energies are, are, are equal. Right? So when they st those start becoming equal, you can imagine that the electrons are going to try to avoid each other by trying to climb up the parabolic well. And so that's when you start to get the zigzag transition. So even classically, you predict a zigzag transition. But the details are quite different uh, in, uh, in the classical and the quantum case. OK. So here's a plot of the uh, pair density. So, uh, so this is for a spring constant of 0 0.1. OK. And so I'm fixing one electron here. I'm looking at the pair density. And this is in the linear phase. So of course, in the neighborhood, there is some zigzag behavior. But in the long distance, there is no zigzag. Uh, if you uh, now, in, increase the density, then you start uh, seeing a long uh, range zigzag behavior also. Okay? And this is at a, uh, at a stronger uh, uh, spring constant where things are more washed out. Okay? But now I'm going to plot things in a different way, which makes, uh, ma makes the zigzag correlation more clear. So the point is that uh, things here are getting washed out partly because the, uh, uh, the position along the wire tends to fluctuate of the electrons. Okay, So instead of plotting things versus the position along the wire, we uh, plot things uh, uh, versus the ordering of the electrons along the wire. Okay, So if you do that, so now uh, I'm, so I'm plotting this zigzag correlation function. Okay, So I have this i to the sorry, minus 1 to the i and i minus 1 to the j to, uh, to, uh, in, in the definition. So now, uh, so there are various rs values. And if you look at the curves for the, uh, either the largest or the smallest rs values, you will see that the zigzag correlation at large distances goes to 0, whereas the four intermediate rs values you, uh, it, uh, it saturates to a finite zigzag correlation. Okay, And that's true both for omega equal to 0.1 and omega equal to 0.6. Okay. So now, starting from the zigzag correlation function, we uh, define a zigzag order parameter. So basically, we don't want to look at the short range behavior. We just want to look at the correlation function beyond some distance. Okay, so we average the, lo the longer range uh, uh, zigzag correlation function. Okay, so over here, we are removing this initial part and just looking at the long range part. And then, so for this uh, zigzag order parameter, you find this sharp transition as you reduce RS, where the zigzag order parameter develops. And then gradually, it dies away. As, uh, as you go into the liquid. Okay? Classically, uh, this is the predicted behavior. Okay? So, uh, so for uh, the small spring, uh, spring constant, uh, the classical behavior, uh, at least the onset, is pretty close to the quantum. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, the classical does not pr predict uh, liquid uh, at higher densities, uh, whereas uh, for, uh, for omega equal to 0.6, uh, even the onset is quite uh, uh, different from the classical behavior. OK, so that's all I wanted to say. And these are my 
collaborators in the two different topics that I've uh, talked about. And uh, these are people uh, that I've benefited by talking to a great deal. Thank you. Yeah, it depends very much on the U value. So right now, on a single core, you know, you still, uh, it depends on the U value, it depends on the filling, right? Okay. So when you, uh, when you approach uh, the half filling, you, you know, we get close to half filling, the initiator bias is still quite large. And so it's still not, uh, a, at least on a single core, it's not an interesting method uh, for actually studying the Hubbard model. You know, even after you get this three orders of magnitude gain in efficiency. Uh, of course, the method can be easily paralyzed, and that would uh, extend the range of applicability. So uh, would your best, so you said like rotate the orbitals, which I, means, I assume that means linear combinations of them. Yeah. And therefore, so if you just did the love V, uh, that's one body density matrix. Orbitals, is that what people use? Uh, well, I mean, no. I mean, that's, what the, that's the lower of CI is best. Uh, I don't think using natural orbitals actually helps very much compared to using Hartree Fock orbitals. Or for the Hubbard model, because there you have momentum conservation. But even in chemistry, they're not that different from each other. So uh, maybe a small. Yeah. I mean, we played with it a tiny bit also, but. Uh, uh, so, but so the, if not those, then what rotations? Well, so I mean, for example, you can imagine that for the Hubbard model, if you uh, worked in real space, <coughs> if you were at very large U, close to half filling, real space would probably work better than momentum space, right? No, no, but if you're, if you're close to half filling, then that number is not as huge as if you're away from half filling. And so I'm just giving you an example where a different basis may do much better. Okay? But, but it, I agree, it's, uh, it's only going to work in that limited range of parameter space. Yeah. So that, that's one example. Uh, there are other more complicated things that we've tried that uh, have not worked yet, but uh, need to be worked on more. Where we, so my student Hitesh Changlani came up with, with the idea of using uh, uh, natural op orbitals obtained from uh, diagonalizing a small part of the space. I, I don't want to get into that. It hasn't worked yet. But uh, th there are uh, ideas around for doing other things. So the CI approach, you know, is very useful, let's say, in nuclear physics. So, sorry, what is? The CI approach is yeah. very useful in nuclear physics, but usually you want to take advantage of the conservation laws. Yeah. So one of them is angular momentum. Yeah. So if you want to use your method with good angular momentum, yeah. what happens, you know, that you reduce the size of the basis yeah. when you conserve yeah. angular momentum, but then the matrices become much sparse. more complicated. Yes, it that's a good point. Mostly. So the question is, is there a way you think No, no. So we do, uh, we, do, uh, we do impose some quantum numbers. We impose the ones that are easy. Okay? So for example, S sub Z is easy. Uh, time reversal is easy. If we wanted to have an eigenstate of S squared, that would help, except that the cost of calculating the matrix elements becomes a lot harder now. Okay? And so we don't do that. Okay? Uh, in the Hubbard model, uh, again, my student Hitesh Changlani, has uh, uh, has uh, has put in the symmetry, uh, uh, you, you know, all the rotation and reflection symmetries. So that that you can do without a very large cost, and he has done that. And the results really I showed actually were without without using that. So actually, really you, you said, what? what do you mean rotation and reflection? You mean well, I mean, it's uh, you have a fourfold lattice, right? So you have fourfold rotations, oh, okay. you have reflections. 
right? It's so, it's yeah. So you, uh, so you, uh, you, you can use symmetrized states. And you can get, get a considerable gain by doing that, uh, gain both in efficiency and a reduction in uh, initiator bias. Uh, uh, and so we, whichever symmetry operations you can impose without greatly increasing the cost of calculating the matrix elements, yes, you should. <laughs> useful. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure it's useful, but it is something which is studied experimentally. I mean, you know, the the parameters that we chose for uh, for the densities for the transfer spring constant, etc., are ones that are uh, experimentally relevant. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, it's not useful, but it, it, it is interesting and, and it's a system which has been studied experimentally. Yes. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay, if not, thank you, Cyrus, again. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start with the next talk at 11. Right on the side. Right.